Good evening, everyone. My name is Ken Howard and as director of the museum, it's my pleasure to welcome you tonight to our 10th community class. Tonight, we're joined by Pulitzer Prize winner, author, winning author, Dr. David Zucchino, and historian, Dr. David Waters, who's also the deputy secretary for history and archives for the Department of Natural and Cultural Resources. We're gonna join them for a conversation about David Zucchino's book, Wilmington's Lie. Our community class program was created with the goal of educating and engaging all citizens on various aspects of North Carolina history. The goal of the series is to explore the historical contributions of the underrepresented communities across our state and nation and connect these histories to contemporary issues. By bringing these historical issues, figures, and events to the forefront, the series will encourage learning, conversation, awareness, and understanding. Until now, Community Class has been a virtual series that we began during the pandemic, but we're pleased to be able to offer it now in person, so we're glad to have you here tonight, in addition to continuing to offer this virtually. While we're not streaming this program tonight, we are recording it, and it will be hosted on our website so that others can see it later on. So I please would ask you to silence your phone so in the middle of our taping, you don't get a call from your mother or your son or daughter or whoever. Um, all of our community classes, all the ones we've done so far, are available on our website. So if you'd like to go back and watch some of them, you can go to ncmuseumofhistory.org, which is where all of our programs are recorded and where you'll find them. You'll also find a great list of our upcoming programs and events and exhibits including our American Indian Heritage Celebration, which is gonna be on Saturday, November the 19th. It's our largest single one day event where we focus on North Carolina's American Indian culture and heritage. Our current exhibits, which we will hope you'll come back and see later on, are The Power of Women in Country Music, which is from the Grammy Museum in Los Angeles. North Carolina A to Z, which tells North, Carolina, uh, North Carolina's history by the alphabet, and yes, B is for basketball and Polly Murray, Imp, Crusader, Dude, Priest. Following the lecture, there will be a book signing in the lobby, so if you have not already purchased your book, we do have them for sale in the shop. And now, it is my pleasure to introduce the creator of our community class series and our head of our education section, Crystal Regan. Crystal, she'll introduce our speakers. Good evening, everyone, and thank you, Ken, for that gracious welcome. My name is Crystal Regan, and I'm Education Section Chief here at the North Carolina Museum of History, and I wanna get right to it and introduce our distinguished guest for tonight, our speaker and our moderator. For tonight's book discussion on Wilmington's Lie, the murderous coup of 1898, and the rise of white supremacy, Mr. David Zacchino has 50 years of experience as a journalist and reporter. He has reported from across the United States and from more than three dozen countries, and I won't read all of them. He has served as newspaper bureau chief in Lebanon, Nairobi, and Johannesburg. He is a graduate of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and began his journalism career at the Raleigh News and Observer. He has worked for the Detroit Free Press and the Philadelphia Inquirer he is currently a national correspondent for the Los Angeles Times. David Zacchino is a two-time Pulitzer Prize winner and four-time finalist. He was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for this book, Wilmington's Lie. In this latest book project, he uses contemporary newspaper accounts, diaries, letters, and official communications to create a gripping and compelling narrative that weaves together individual stories of hate, fear, and brutality. It is a definitive account of a remarkable and often ignored chapter of American history. Our moderator for the evening is Dr. Darren Waters, Deputy Secretary for the Office of Archives and History. He oversees the operations of the divisions of state history and maritime museums, state historic sites, archives, and historical records. He is also the secretary of the North Carolina Historical Commission and state historic preservation officer. He's originally from Asheville and was most recently an associate professor of history at UNC Asheville 
and the executive director of UNCA's Office of Community Engagement. He received a BA in political science and government from Liberty University, a, master's, a master in history from North Carolina State University, and a PhD in history from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. We will have a short presentation by David, followed by conversation with Dr. Waters, including a few questions from the audience. Afterward, we will conclude our conversation and transition to the lobby for the book signing. Ladies, gentlemen, and everyone, Mr. David Sacchino. Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay, great. Uh, thank you, Crystal and Ken, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, I'm going to speak for about 10 minutes. I'm not sure uh, how many of you have read this book or are familiar with uh, the coup in Wilmington, so I'll try to give you an overview, and then we'll go to uh, a discussion with, uh, with Dr. Waters. Oh, by the way, are there no baseball fans here tonight? You know, there's a, <laughs> if, you hear, if you hear the score, don't tell me. I'm recording it at home, so uh, I want to be surprised when I get home tonight. Um, I'd like to talk tonight about a violent event from 124 years ago that still reverberates in some of the racism, demagoguery, disinformation, and political violence we see today. On November 10, 1898, at least 1,500 heavily armed white supremacists in Wilmington, North Carolina, carried out the only lasting armed overthrow of an elected government in American history. White vigilantes and white state militiamen killed at least 60 black men and drove more than 2,000 black citizens from the city two days after the 1898 midterm elections. At the time, Wilmington had one of the few multiracial governments in the South with black men in prominent positions. But the white mob evicted the city's three black and seven white aldermen, the mayor, the police chief, and other elected leaders at gunpoint and installed coup leaders in their place. They burned the city's black newspaper and tried to lynch the black publisher. They banished black leaders who survived the assault as well as white, quote, race traders who had served in city government alongside black men. These black and white leaders were marched at gunpoint to the Wilmington train station, thrown aboard departing trains and told, quote, don't come back or we'll kill you. And not one of them ever dared return, not one. The 1898 coup was a pivotal event, not just for North Carolina, but for the entire South. It cemented white supremacy as state and city policy for the next 60 years and inspired whites across the South to use violence and terror to snuff out the black vote. It also turned a black majority city into a white supremacist citadel. Wilmington was 56% black in 1898. Today, it is less than 18% black. After the coup, black citizens in North Carolina did not vote in significant numbers for almost 70 years until the passage of the Voting Rights Act in 1965. In 1896, two years before the coup, there were 126,000 registered black voters in North Carolina, 126,000. By 1902, just four years after the coup, the number had been whittled down to 6,100. So you can see how effective the coup was. In 1898, there was just one black man in Congress in either the Senate or the House. George Henry White, from a North Carolina district next to Wilmington, Excuse me, George Henry White from a North Carolina district next to Wilmington. White supremacists hounded Congressman White and his family so viciously that he left North Carolina forever. White's parting words were, quote, I cannot remain in North Carolina and be treated like a man. After the coup, no black citizen from North Carolina served in Congress until 1992, almost 100 years later. And after Wilmington's three black aldermen were forced from office at gunpoint in 1898, no black citizen served in Wilmington's city government until 1972, more than 70 years later. The coup also provided a blueprint for terror and intimidation of black men who tried to vote elsewhere in the South, and it ushered in the Jim Crow era in North Carolina. In 1906, white supremacists in Georgia plotted to steal the midterm election by attacking black voters. But first, they consulted with Wilmington's coup leaders on how to do it. W. Hoke Smith, later elected governor in a stolen election, said, quote, we can handle the blacks the way they handled them in Wilmington, where the woods were black with their hanging carcasses. 
Now, some of you have probably never heard of the Wilmington coup. Until I read about centennial events in Wilmington in newspaper coverage in 1998, I hadn't either. And I went to high school and college in North Carolina. The coup was never mentioned by any professor or in any history book in high school or in college. Many people who've read this book have the same two questions I had when I first learned of the coup in 1998. One, how can I not know about this? And two, how could this happen in the United States of America? My answer is this is a forgotten chapter of American history that was covered up or mischaracterized for a century. And it happened at a time when white supremacy went unchallenged. Victors indeed write history, so after the 1898, so after 1898, white supremacist leaders in Wilmington wrote the narrative of their coup. They portrayed it as a, quote, good government initiative that replaced corrupt and incompetent black leaders with honest white men. And they claimed it was black men, not white supremacists, who were stockpiling weapons and planning a race riot. They called the coup a race riot, in fact, a black-inspired riot rather than a violent act of domestic terrorism by armed white supremacists. A century later, it was still being referred to as a race riot, but in fact, it was a racial massacre, a planned murder spree, and a white supremacist coup. That's why this book is titled Wilmington's Lie, for the lie that stood for decades. It's hard to believe, but no one was ever held accountable. No one was arrested or charged for the murders or the coup, and the federal government did absolutely nothing, and we can talk about that later. Now, why was Wilmington such a threat to whites? First, it was a black majority city at a time when almost all major southern cities had white, ma white majorities. Second, Wilmington was an outlier, a bold experiment in multiracial government 30 years after the Civil War. Black men served in positions of authority. 10 of Wilmington's 26 police officers were black men. The county treasurer, jailer, and coroner were black men. So were many magistrates. There was a thriving black middle class of doctors, lawyers, teachers, merchants, and artisans. The federal customs collector at the Wilmington port was a black man who earned more than the white governor. This was intolerable to white supremacists. They vowed to overthrow, quote, Negro rule and, quote, Negro domination by, quote, the ballot or the bullet or both. They even had a name for their effort. They proudly called it the White Supremacy Campaign. They issued a booklet for white voters explaining the tenets of white supremacy and black inferiority. Here's one quote from the handbook that's quite clear about white intentions. Quote, this is a white man's country and white men must control and govern it. The coup leader's ultimate goal was not just to overthrow Wilmington's multiracial government, but to deny black men the right to vote or hold public office forever. Their main weapon was a fake news and disinformation campaign led by Josephus Daniels, publisher of the News and Observer newspaper right here in Raleigh. Daniels planted phony stories about blacks to incite whites to, at to attack them. And for the nearly 25% of white voters who were illiterate, Daniels hired a cartoonist to draw race-baiting cartoons depicting black men as beasts, criminals, and thugs. White supremacist leaders also told white voters that black men were not intelligent enough to vote and too corrupt and incompetent to serve in office. They warned, too, of, quote, the black beast rapist. That's the term they used. White newspapers published fake news of a purported epidemic of rapes of white women by black men while also reporting that black men were stealing white jobs. Now, white supremacists not only had fake news, but they also had their own militias. These were called the Red Shirts in the outgrowth of the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan. They served as armed vigilantes for the white supremacist campaign. In the summer and fall of 1898, their job was to terrorize black families and prevent black men from voting. Red Shirts rode through the Cape Fear countryside at night and burst into black homes. They hauled out black men and beat them and whipped them. They warned them that they would come back and kill them if they dared register to vote. At the same time, many white employers in Wilmington fired any black man who they found out had registered to vote. On the day of the midterm election in Wilmington on November, sorry, November 8, 1898, red shirts threatened and intimidated black men trying to vote. They succeeded in drastically reducing black turnout while stuffing ballot boxes and stealing the election. The night before the election, Colonel Alfred Moore Waddell, a coup leader who installed himself as mayor after the coup two days later, gave a fiery speech to a gathering of, of hundreds of cheering and gun-waving red shirts in Wilmington. 
I'll finish by reading Colonel Waddell's exact words. Quote, you are the sons of noble ancestry. You are Anglo-Saxons and you are armed and prepared and you will do your duty. Go to the polls tomorrow and if you find the Negro outvoting, tell him to leave the polls. And if he refuses, kill him, shoot him down in his tracks. And on that note, um, I'll stop and Darren and I will have a little conversation. Thank you. Oh, thank you, David. Um, and you gave us a lot just in that brief, <laughs> um, in that brief overview of your book. I'm glad to be here with you all tonight. David and I think we had a good conversation in, in the we back. Did. And we're going to try not to go too deep into the weeds here and to give you an opportunity to participate in this conversation sooner rather than later. But um, David knows that, you know, one of the first questions that I had for him, and I think that I would like to begin with that question, is just what motivated you to write this book? Well, as I say, uh, I grew up in North Carolina, went to high school and college here, and had never heard of this event. And when I read newspaper coverage of the centennial events in, in Wilmington in 1998, I was shocked and I was also intrigued and just fascinated, as I said in, in my talk, that something like this could happen in the United States and that I would not be aware of it. So I looked into it and there really had not been much in, in the popular press written about this. There had been a lot of academic uh, books, but there not, they had not really been uh, any published account for, for a wider mass audience. And I just decided at some point I was gonna write a book. Um, I was a foreign correspondent overseas for many years and, and really got wrapped up in that. But by several years ago, I finally got a chance to sit down and go through and do the research, which took a couple of years, and write the book. And I think this is just an important story, a forgotten story that needs to be told. And, and it's a story that we can learn from. I mean, it has so much relevance to what's happening today. And, and, and we can talk about right. that later. It, you know, and David, um, this sounds, you talking about the fact that nothing had been written about this, you didn't learn about this in high school or uh, taking history classes, it sounds f similar to what stories that I heard just, I guess, last year are in uh, night, um, just recent 2020 uh, with the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa mm -hmm. riots as well. And I think I was struck in those interviews about people who had grown up in Tulsa, Oklahoma, who had no idea or heard anything about this event. Yeah. Why do you think that that's the case? Why is it that we've kind of covered over this particular part of our past? Well, in both cases, it was white supremacists uh, who, who carried out the events mm -hmm. and who controlled the narrative. They controlled uh, the media. They controlled the story. And uh, it was in their interests um, to deny it and cover it up. And they were incredibly successful. Um, in the case of Wilmington, um, as you can imagine, uh, the black community was in total disarray after this coup. I mean, 2,000 black people just were forced overnight to leave town uh, and never to come back. Uh, the black newspaper was burned. 60 men were murdered. These are friends and neighbors of these people. Uh, there's just no way that they could get the story out under those conditions. And, and if they did talk about it, they risk retribution from whites, right. uh, even when they fled to, uh, to the north. Um, I'm not as familiar with Tulsa, but I, I do know from what I've read about it that the, the white supremacists found it in their interest just to uh, let that story die. Mm -hmm. And, and it worked. Um, I really think we, we Americans, and this is a sort of a broad condemnation, but uh, tend not to be all that interested in history, unfortunately, okay. and um, don't really probe and, and look uh, into events that maybe they haven't heard about. And these are events that are very relevant today. All right. Well, it's good that I'm not in Asheville right now about what I'm getting ready to say, because it's kind of a going joke in Asheville. Uh, people who know me there that I'll always mention the name of Alexis de Tocqueville, because I'm a <laughs> huge fan of Alexis de Tocqueville. If you haven't read Democracy in America, you should. So something that you just said made his name kind of resonate with me is that he, he made the argument when he was here in the 1830s and while he was studying American democracy, and then he wrote his book, Democracy in America, 
there's a, there's a part of the book where he says that Americans are not given to studying history, that we, we tend to be a present-minded people, are just thinking about more about the future than we do about the past. Now, I like to think that Tocqueville thought that that would eventually change and that we would, mm. we would become more historically minded in, in thinking about our history and our past. Now, you, you raised a point in your comments that it's important for us to study this. And one of my favorite historians is David Blight, who we had here uh, when we were commemorating the 250th anniversary of the, of the uh, Civil War. David opened those conversations written great books, one of, he's a fellow Pulitzer Prize right. winner Frederick as well. Frederick Douglass, his book on Frederick Douglass, but his book, um, I think, American Oracle, The Civil War and the Civil Rights Era. You know, he makes the point about historians and me being one, sometimes I feel like, you know, he said, we kind of pick at wounds, you know, scabs, we don't allow it to heal. But I do think that it is important for us to talk about these difficult parts of our past as well. And you've made that point. Can you elaborate on that a little bit of why it is important for us to study this period? For one thing, this story is very unpleasant. I had a hard time doing the research. I, I was appalled and I was angry, but we still need to know these things. Um, we can't just uh, sweep it under the rug. And I think a lot of people just don't want to hear unpleasant facts and, and painful things. And, and there are some, just some horrible things in this book, some mm -hmm. horrible things that happen. But if we don't study these and, and, and figure out, well, why do these things happen? Who makes them happen? Why? What were the motivations? We need to study that. And as I said, it's relevant for what's happening today. Um, in 1898, the white supremacists tried everything to suppress the black vote from, from overt violence uh, to gerrymandering uh, to using uh, disinformation in the media. We're seeing the same thing today, and the media landscape is so much different now. Um, the Internet makes it so easy to spread false mm -hmm. news, fake news, and, and misinformation. And... We have politicians today who are geniuses at riling people, at, at getting at their, their hatreds and their grievances and playing on them and setting up um, scapegoats, mm -hmm. which is what the white supremacists did in 1898. And unless you're aware of that history and see what happened, see what it led to, we're going to be in the danger of repeating that right. again today. And we saw it on January 6th. Right. So David, so what do you, do you have any recommendations of what we can do to kind of broaden the awareness of not just this event, but of other events, um, the good, the bad, and the ugly about American, American history? Listen to people like you, okay. <laughs> listen to historians. Okay. Uh, we journalists have a, a role to play and I, I when I'm writing uh, stories, uh, even overseas, I try to find historical parallels or something in history that's relevant. And I think that's important. I think people should stop in their daily lives and, and look back uh, and see what happened in the past and see if we're repeating the same things. Okay. So you, you mentioned a lot of names uh, you know, in this book. Uh, one of the names that really stands out to me, you mentioned, I think you mentioned in it earlier in your brief talk, but the name of Alex R. Alexander Manley. He's a, a prominent figure in this story. Can you tell us a little bit more about Alex Manley? Who was he? He was uh, the most intriguing character in this book and the most intriguing character I came ap across. And I think part of it because he's a fellow journalist. He was the, the publisher of uh, the Daily Record, which was um, claimed to be the only a uh, daily black readership newspaper in the country, and he may have been right. Um, he was the grandson of a white governor, which I found very, very interesting. And he was very light-skinned, and um, there was a lot of comment at the time that, uh, hey, Alex, you know, you can pass as a white man. And he made a decision that he was going to live his life as a proud black man. Black man. And once he started that newspaper, he really, really started attacking white supremacy, and that made him a target, and he was probably the main target of the entire coup, but he just pounded away in editorials uh, against the white supremacists, uh, what they were trying to do to black men, trying to get uh, black men in particular um, to rise up and take action, and he had a hard time. Um, he was a very uh, a lonely prophet. Uh, a lot of people didn't want trouble, and you can understand why if you were a black person at that time when um, you're probably happy just to have a job. Um, the, the white 
power structure is so overwhelming and so powerful um, that you just want to go along, keep your job, feed your family. And a, and a lot of uh, black men were living middle class lives then. And, and Alex Manley tried to shake them and wake them up. Um, he succeeded to a certain extent, but he exposed himself to retribution and he actually had to flee the city to avoid being lynched and he would have been killed if he had stayed there. Now, Manley, is he, was he a North Carolina native? Do you know? And, and I'm curious to find out where did he go when he left mm -hmm. um, and what happened to him in his career. You, right. you talk about that. Yeah, it was interesting. He, he was a North Carolinian. He was born outside uh, Raleigh. He went to Hampton Institute in, in Virginia and ended up in Wilmington as a house painter uh, and then got into journalism. And once he was uh, forced to flee the city, he went to Philadelphia and built a career there um, helping young black men from the South who had fled the South uh, to train them um, to work in um, various jobs, uh, mostly in industry blue collar jobs. And he set up an entire foundation for this and was extremely successful and, and well known. And so he had this second life. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly, he never went back to Wilmington. He was terrified and I would be too uh, because uh, they had threatened to shoot him on site. And he never went back. Now, Alex, you know, if we can continue to talk about him for a brief minute here. And he ended up responding to someone and the name that shows up in the book as well, someone who I've kind of paid a bit of mm -hmm. attention to. She's an inter interesting character. You don't hear her name much, but Rebecca Latimer Felton, you know, who has the distinction. We talked about mm -hmm. this in the back. She has the distinction of being the first woman to serve in the United States Senate. She was appointed to the Senate by the governor of Georgia when Tom Watson, I think when Watson died in office, she did not serve in the Senate long. It was only for maybe a day or two, but she still has that distinction. But she's a factor in, oh, yeah. in, in this as well. Can you tell us a little bit more about um, Rebecca? Yeah, essentially she gave a speech in Georgia challenging white men there to do something about what she, claimed falsely uh, was a, an epidemic of rapes by black men of white women, which was not true at all. But she challenged white men um, to kill any black men that they suspected of having any kind of uh, contact with a white woman. And her, the, the salient quote from her speech was, um, if it takes lynching, I say lynch a thousand times a week if necessary. I mean, she openly just said, we need to kill as many black men as possible because they're all sexual predators. Alex Manley read this and he was outraged and sat down in uh, August of 1898 and wrote an editorial in response to Mrs. Felton uh, he made two main points. One, that um, most black men or many black men who were accused and, and, and lynched for allegedly um, having relations with white women were in fact their consensual lovers. And in this just enraged the white community. The other point he made was that for generations, white men had been raping black women with impunity. And these were both very true and, and the truth hurts and this enraged the white community and the red shirts were ready to lynch Alex Manley. This was in August. And to show you how uh, premeditated this coup was, the leaders of the coup said, no, this is too early. We need to use this issue and this editorial as, as uh, in the election coming up in November. They said, just wait till November. We've got the coup plan and then you can lynch Alex Manley. Well, they did burn the newspaper, they didn't lynch Alex, but um, he was lucky to get out alive. But um, I was just um, fascinated by, by his courage and standing up and, and just being heard. There's something you said earlier too that interests me here. You talk, you used the word uh, accommodations mm -hmm. and the accommodations, we hear that word, a, a number of us, you know, study American history, we usually associate that word with Booker T. Washington, right. you know, and especially his speech, the Atlanta address. But do you do you identify who some of the accommodationists in Wilmington were, and did they do you did you find anything that suggested that they responded 
to Alex on this mm -hmm. or tried to encourage him not to respond right. to Rebecca uh, Latterman Felton. Oh, absolutely. Uh, the leader was uh, John Dancy, and he was the customs collector at the at the port. And as I said, he made more than the governor. He he lived a very good life, and he wanted to protect this. And he was the leader of the accommodation movement in in Wilmington at the time. And he counseled black men: keep your head down, go to work. Try to vote if you can, but don't, don't antagonize our white friends because they're generally good people. But if you antagonize them, uh, we're gonna have problems and we don't want any problems. We're doing really well here. And when Alex wrote this editorial, John Dancy, with a few other accommodations, approached him and said, you've got to take it back. You know, you've got to apologize. And he said, absolutely not. And, and Dancy even wrote uh, a statement for him. He said, just publish this in the paper, said, you're sorry, mm -hmm. it was a misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. And he refused to do it. And he stood up uh, to Dancy. And interestingly, uh, Dancy, he was a federal employee and, and he was pretty safe because the, the white supremacists were, were pretty smart. They knew that if they attacked uh, a black federal employee or appointee, um, there would be trouble and that might invite uh, federal troops. So they, they left him alone. But um, they used him later as a spokesman uh, for the black community. Mm -hmm. After the coup, he said, oh, everybody, come on back. Everything's fine. Uh, go back to work. And we've got to accept uh, this new white leadership. This is just the natural way of things, but we'll do fine. You know, we'll keep our jobs and our families in. Um, there were several men like him, and there were other men uh, like Alex Manley and uh, William Henderson, a lawyer who, who stood up and, and paid the price. They, they had to leave town uh, and barely got out of line right. with their families. Do you, do you follow Dancy any further beyond this? What happens to him? Do you know what happens mm -hmm. to him after this? Is, this he got is his over? job back. Oh. <laughs> he, got, yeah. he played it right, he moved back and, and he wasn't bothered. And he, he remained in that position, I forget for how long, but he did get it back. Wow. And um, he, was, he was tolerated by the whites because he said the things they wanted to hear. Oh. Well, you, I'm interested to before take a few questions um, from the audience here, and I don't want to steal anyone else's question here, but I am curious that as this event unfold, uh, unfolded, how did the state government respond? You had Daniel Russell is governor. If you can tell us anything about Daniel Russell and who he was, uh, the Republican governor of the, right. of the state. And how did the federal government respond? You know, as I read through and as I think about this period of, of history and think about the United States Constitution, which guarantees, guarantees a Republican form of government for each state, how did the federal government respond to this or not respond and why? It was very interesting. Uh, William McKinley was president. And before the coup, because the, the white supremacists had made it very clear, they had announced what they were going to do. They told everybody they were going to do it. And in fact, the, the northern press swarmed Wilmington because they went to, down to cover what they called the race war. And because um, this was so well known, uh, there was a clergyman and Congressman White went to the White House before the coup and warned McKinley. And they said, sir, um, these white supremacists are going to kill black men. They're going to keep us from voting. They're going to eliminate the vote. You've got to send federal troops. And McKinley refused. After the coup, uh, White and the same clergyman went back to him and appealed again, please send troops to preserve the black men's right to vote. He absolutely refused. And I could find no record that uh, McKinley made any public comment about the coup. I did find a record of a cabinet meeting when it was discussed um, the day after the coup, uh, but there was no public um, announcement of what, if anything, the government intended to do, and they did absolutely nothing. As I mentioned in my talk, no one was ever uh, prosecuted. Uh, no one was ever held accountable. Um, McKinley's uh, attorney general did uh, appoint the um, Republican um, attorney general, uh, state, state attorney in, in Raleigh, mm -hmm. and he convened a grand jury, but every black person that he approached was terrified and didn't want to testify. Uh, and, the, and the white leaders of the white supremacy campaign, when they were called, they just said, oh, it was a perfect election. There weren't any problems. We didn't see anything. So the mm -hmm. grand jury collapsed and, and obviously no one was ever indicted. So Daniel Russell, did he make a request that he, along with people like uh, George Henry White make a request to the president for some action to support this. And why yeah. do, 
are you curious as to why yeah. Russell Russell seems to have fallen silent? Yeah, he was a, a complicated figure. Um, he was uh, a member of the the Rice White Gentry in mm -hmm. Wilmington. He's from Wilmington, and all his friends and relatives were the leaders of the white supremacy campaign, and they completely intimidated him. They threatened him. Um, he was almost killed on election day. He had to hide in a rail car to keep away from the red shirts. Uh, the white supremacists made it very clear that if he stood up and defended the, the black voters who had put him in office, um, that uh, he would be either removed from office or he might be killed. And he was intimidated, he was terrified, so he did nothing along those lines of asking for help. In fact, he dispatched white militias, murderous white militias, full of white supremacists from various towns around North Carolina to help suppress what he knew was not a black riot, but right. what he portrayed as a black riot because it served his purposes. He knew very well what was going mm. on. Um, so he um, completely abdicated all his, his job. He didn't, didn't do his job uh, because he was terrified. Um, he almost uh, had a mob. He had a mob around the, uh, the governor's mansion in Raleigh. Uh, on election day, threatening to kill him and his wife. Oh, right. <laughs> so a heightened uh, uh, era of fear mm -hmm. and terror that this was. Um, I'm going to take a liberty to ask one more question and then open it up to the audience. The word fusion. Fusion comes up in your in this text a lot. And you and I talked about mm -hmm. that a bit in, uh, in the back prior to coming out. And you said that you hadn't heard this term before. I, I found that as, as, as a professor when I was teaching that many students were not familiar mm -hmm. with this term. Can you tell us a little bit more about this word? What was fusion? Right. Well, you know better than I do, but I'll do my best. <laughs> okay. um, it was essentially a, a, a fusion of um, disaffected former white, uh, former Democrats who happened to be white, and most a lot of them were farmers and were disillusioned with the Democratic Party. They felt that it was the, the tool of the, uh, the big banks and the railroad and the moneyed class and that their interests uh, as farmers and, and trying to educate their children were not being met. So they defected from the Democratic Party and in some cases unwillingly created a partnership with uh, black voters, black men uh, voters who were aligned with the Republican Party. At this time, you have to remember, uh, the Republican Party was the party of Lincoln uh, and the Democrats were the party of white supremacy. And so there was this really uh, interesting uh, joining of, of people who had similar interests from totally different worlds. You have uh, white farmers, uh, lower middle class, and um, black men, some of them uh, professional black men, a lot of middle class black men, um, voting for the Republicans, and they created this government in Wilmington that was this fusion mm -hmm. of, the, uh, of the Republicans and the disaffected Democrats that uh, won the election, a disputed election, by the way, just like today, the, the losing white supremacists claimed that uh, black men had voted illegally, that there was fraud, and that the election was stolen. Mm -hmm. Same old thing. Uh, but anyway, this uh, government comes into power in Wilmington and in the state legislature, uh, fusionists also took control of the state legislature. Well, it's interesting to think about the fusion uh, movement. I, you know, I'll say this, that yeah, I, when I was taking classes at Chapel Hill, I think it mm -hmm. was probably my main professor, Harry Watson, who made the point that if you think about um, biracial coalitions, which a fusionist movement was, that there are three periods in American history, just early American history, where there were biracial coalitions. And to my surprise, he pointed to um, the Nathaniel Bacon Rebellion in, in colonial Virginia, which was biracial in its makeup with Native Americans and African uh, people of African descent and, and white uh, indentured servants. And then during Reconstruction, you had another biracial coalition, which was essentially forced together through you know constitutional um, amendments to the Constitution. Mm -hmm. But the, the fusionist movement he pointed to as being rather unique in that it was a voluntary right. biracial coalition, which was then smashed by this violent uh, white supremacist campaign. So exactly. these are interesting periods of history that I think that it is important, like you, that we know more about. So what I'm going to do is open it up to you all. I'm sure that you're thinking about, you have a number of questions on your mind, and we want to open it up to give you an opportunity to kind of engage David in conversation as well. So if you just raise your hand, if you have a question, and they'll bring a mic to you. 
And meanwhile, Darren, if uh, you want to answer any of these questions, feel okay. free because you're the historian. <laughs> right. Hi, I was raised in Wilmington, North Carolina, and I learned about this about five years ago at a um, church conference that was held down there. They took a tour of the sites, and it was all the places that I knew and had grown up with. Um, but I had no idea. Do you know if now history books, North Carolina history books in particular, but all history books, are they beginning to get to where we realize and they publicize something like this? I, I just, I'm stunned that I didn't know about it. I really am, and I'm ashamed that I didn't know about it. Right. Um, not to my knowledge. I don't know if you've looked into I think, this. Yeah, but I think we're now beginning to make mm -hmm. that, you know, make the, the effort to, end, to upgrade, you know, our history text to address some of these. I would also like to, you know, um, there was a commission that was set up to study this, you know, years ago, uh, the Wilmington coup, which we refer to it now. And I, I was, it was interesting to hear you, David, talk about the mischaracterization mm -hmm. of this, not as a coup, but as a, as a riot. riot. Yeah. By, by was, black men. Yeah. yeah, but it was it was a coup to overthrow of a, a legitimately elected government. And I'd also like to give, you know, give a shout out to our colleague, uh, Larray Umfleet, who has written the book uh, Day of Blood, mm -hmm. um, which covers this this period as well, which you can get um, get a copy of that book. But efforts are being made now to really begin to talk about this more openly, which is something that we need to do. And that commission, I think, that was set up, and it would have been in the early 2000s, 2006. because it was prior to John Hope Franklin, because I think John Hope Franklin uh, participated in mm -hmm. conversations around that. Many of you will recognize that name, but it was prior to, right. his, uh, to his death in 2009 that that commission actually did that work. So I think we are turning the corner on this now to be more honest and forthright about what these uh, periods of history have looked like. So I think we are making improvements. Yeah, I've Next had question. several teachers come up to me after book talks and saying it's not in the uh, curriculum, not on the syllabus, but they were going to bring it up bring anyway it and, and teach it. And uh, speaking of textbooks, if you do read a book towards the back, there are examples of uh, North Carolina history textbooks for high school students that describe the coup as a riot, as perpetrated by mm. black men, and as a good government initiative um, to clean up uh, a corrupt and illegitimate government. I mean, read it in there. There's several examples from the 30s and the 40s, just astonishing. And David, I don't want to forget, but it, it would, we'll take this next question, but I'd like to come back to, because you talk about, I've heard you talk about the 1868 Const North Carolina mm -hmm. Constitution. And if we get you to talk a okay. little bit about that and why is that Constitution? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, if, um, I'd love to hear a little about your research efforts, mm -hmm. uh, two aspects of it in particular. One is, given that the victors write the history, how difficult was it for you to uh, separate fact from fiction and number two did you interview descendants of any of the cool leaders and how did that go yeah great that's a, that's a great question um i've written two other books before this and they were these were contemporary events that i took part in that i witnessed and and i could interview people about it uh, in this case of course everyone's dead so every single sentence in this book came from a piece of paper from a document somewhere so that was a real challenge for me i am not a trained uh, historian <laughs> like you are uh, I'm a journalist, so I'm, I'm used to, to digging up facts and, and, and finding information, uh, but I had to spend a lot of time in libraries digging out all these documents. Uh, there were speeches and letters and memoirs, newspaper stories. So it took quite a while and, and it was a real challenge and it was frustrating not to be able to interview people because I would love to talk to the people who, who are on both sides of this. Um, your other question was um, trying to get the whole story. Yes, I did uh, interview uh, particularly uh, Alex uh, Manley's grandson, who was fabulous. I talked to um, uh, Frank Daniels Jr., who just passed away recently, uh, the grandson of, of Josephus and, and several others. And it was fascinating uh, talking to these people who actually knew their grandfathers, had met them as, as children. I mean, there's that direct connection, and um, you can read in the book some of, some of their comments, and uh, I was glad I did, and I got a few more others. I think your other question was um, reconciling the story, since so much of it was told by whites, it was very difficult to get the black perspective because, as you can imagine, uh, the black citizens of Wilmington were on the run. 
Um, their friends and neighbors were being murdered. They were driven out of town. The newspaper was burned. And so there were not as many sources. Uh, luckily, uh, there were a couple of ministers uh, and a lawyer who wrote memoirs and wrote accounts of what happened. And the other good source of information was even as these uh, black citizens of Wilmington fled out uh, to other parts of the South and mostly to the North, when they got there, black newspaper, black readership newspapers interviewed them and got contemporaneous mm -hmm. accounts just a few days later. And so that was excellent. And also Alex Manley's um, widow wrote some letters to her sons that were really fascinating, uh, describing what had happened. And Alex Manley himself wrote a, a little bit about it. So there was just uh, a lot of information out there, but it takes a while to, to dig it up. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Right, right behind you. Oh, yes. Oh, I just had a comment on a few things that you uh, had said. And um, I was wondering, like, when you said that people don't really value history that much, I think it's more of a point that people tend to glorify the things that make them feel good and then suppress the things that don't make them feel good. You know, and also, we also made another point when you said that back in the days when this occurred, that um, you couldn't believe that you didn't hear about it. Mm -hmm. And we all know, I mean, well, I know, that the reason that we don't hear about it, that things tend to get suppressed when they're coming from the minority perspective than when it's coming from the majority perspective. And like you said, all of this correlates with what's going on today in the situation mm -hmm. that's perpetuating today is a constantly uh, 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 a thing of let's keep this down because it makes me feel bad mm -hmm. or let's not talk about this because it's not comfortable for me. I just like to say, how do you think the people that went through it, how do you think their comfortable, you know, level was? You know, maybe if we continue to discuss these things, it might change. Yeah, yeah. you make a good point about people wanting to uh, selectively uh, remember history. And you can see this with the, the Confederate monuments and, and, and this whole worshiping of the, of the lost cause, uh, which actually came about in the 1920s, not, not right after 1898. But I mean, that's another story, but that's a great point. Yes, sir. Right back to Brian. I'd just like to uh, contribute a little bit more to the discussion of what Wilmington knows. About three hours ago, I was reading a website uh, with a Wilmington address to it, which in fact is arguing very, very strongly that uh, the Republican uh, arguments of 1898 uh, and is looking at this as a, an ongoing discussion. And I've also heard from people in Wilmington who have uh, in trying to bring forth the uh, uh, insurrection story, face considerable uh, blowback, if not threats, in the process. There's also at least one website that is funded by a reasonably well uh, endowed organization, politically uh, focused, that in fact um, offers teachers a sort of a brief Here's what you might need to know to teach a class in fill in the blanks. One of them is the Wilmington insurrection, and in fact, it also takes the Republican side and sees it as more of an economic issue uh, that uh, was unfairly foist upon the Democrats. Okay, thank you. I don't know if you had a comment, uh, no, no. a follow-up. Yeah. No. no. Okay. No. We may come back to it, but thank you for offering for offering that. I think there's another. Question. Um, thinking about your um, situation where you were uh, talking to the school teachers, the, the history teachers, and what a difficult position they must find themselves in um, at times, especially as it relates to a situation like this where what is in their resources has been proven to overlook or proven false, however you want to describe that. but. I was just trying to think how, and, th and I'm not sure there's a good answer to this, but how do teachers of history proceed 
um, especially in situations like this where they have textbooks and resources. And there's the Wilmington lie, but certainly there are lies yeah. <laughs> um, that, that haven't been, um, I guess, uh, raised up the flagpole at this point. So um, I'm just uh, I'm just thinking of the difficult yeah. situation. That they're they're in a there. very difficult uh, position, particularly now that the, this critical race theory has, has arisen as a as a very divisive issue. Um, with allegations that, that teachers are trying to indoctrinate uh, the youth with, with a certain viewpoint. viewpoint. So um, I know it's very difficult for these teachers. And then just finding the information because the textbooks, to my knowledge, don't have it. Um, they just don't. Do, I, I've looked at some textbooks from um, the last several years, and there's maybe a line or two you know, about the Wilmington coup, about a short discussion. They call it a race riot. Um, so they're, they're really in a difficult position. And you know, and I will add to that, David and I, and I talked a, a bit in in the back, and um, you know, I taught at the college level, uh, so there, you know, we can do some different things yeah. at the college level. So I do sympathize with with K through 12 teachers and how they can they can deal with these issues. You know, as a college professor, you know that education is supposed to challenge you. You know, we are in this kind of this space now where we want to make everybody comfortable, but education by design is supposed to discomfort, to be a, a process of dis discomfort. I had the opportunity to hear uh, Cornel West talk uh, once to talk about what education is supposed to do, that it is it's a process of dying and then being reborn through that process. But we don't want to do that all the time. But, and I have come to the conclusion that we do a disservice to ourselves and to our children and to the future by not being forthright and honest about these issues that have happened. Because look at what happens when they discover that they have been being not told the truth for so long. It, it causes these disruptions in our communities and our society that I think that we could probably avoid some of those type of uh, disruptions if we would only be honest about about what the history has been as we've tried to build a more perfect union. And this has been an ongoing process. So I'll just throw, throw that in. Um, it's another question. Yes, sir. Um, I'm also North Carolina born and raised and never heard of any of this until about five or six years ago. But changing the topic just slightly, I had read something about that Wilmington at that time was one of the top two or three ports in America and that at the time, one of the side effects of this was all the skilled workers, the port workers and stuff, got moved out or got kicked out of the jobs, and that the people that took it over didn't know anything about what to do, and that caused the port of Wilmington basically to collapse and never has regained itself. Could you address yeah. some Yeah, of that? it wasn't, wasn't just the report, it was all skilled jobs. Um, and you mentioned uh, the port, it was the, uh, for the last, what, couple of years of the war, it was the only functioning Confederate yeah. port. And it kept the Confederacy alive uh, because the, uh, the supplies came in skirting the, block, the Union blockade. And that was interesting. And that was a revelation to me. But there were many, many skilled jobs, not just at the port, but in the railroads uh, and in town that black men were very good at. And one of the very first things the white supremacists did when they took over the city government was to issue a decree saying all jobs are reserved for white men. And they basically, well, they fired the black police, the black fire, firemen, all blacks who survived the coup and who didn't get run out of town were removed from their jobs and the jobs were given to whites. And the employers started complaining. They said the whites weren't, didn't have the skills. Or, or the aptitude to do the job, and they started asking to have their black workers back. Um, so this was in a lot of different industries, and, and it really, I found it very interesting that these white employees who had supported the coup were now saying, well, wait a minute, um, we've got to have our black workers back. We, we just can't reserve these jobs for whites, and pretty remarkable. Okay, sorry. Um, so it's not really a question, but just a comment of thanking you. Thank you for your detail. I read your book a couple, several months ago, and it made me very angry and upset. But, um, and, but I thank you for your detailed research, and I thank you for the pictures that you included of the main players. It was like, so it helped me keep it straight in my head. 
Um, and then I've been reading the Anchor online textbook, which I can't remember if it's that, but, um, by one of the state agencies, but it also has an article about the Wilmington um, riot, your your version of it. I mean, not your version of it, but the truth, more the truth. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. An accurate version of what happened, more accurate version of what happened. So there is change in the works. All right. Well, thank you. Hey. Um, I'm a former journalist myself. Uh, I spent about 25 years, coincidentally moved, was transferred back here in 2000, right around the time this commission was created. And so uh, with my wire service, uh, reported on it at the time. And so first off, thank you for all the work that you've done to do a journalistic job of telling mm -hmm. what happened. Uh, and now I'm gonna hit you with a question that's way too complicated. <laughs> but hopefully uh, will spur some thought and is something that I have been thinking about since that time. Um, you've done a great job putting all of this down on paper, really researching the record as one does or should do. But everybody who's here and all the people who are reading the book, we've chosen to do this. We've mm -hmm. chosen to inform ourselves. What learning about the past is something that we do in order largely to inform our future. What can we do to further this story, and not just this story, but racial justice throughout the United States as citizens, as readers, as hopefully educated and intelligent people going forward? You're right, that is a complicated question. <laughs> um, I, what we really need is to break down these walls between conservative and liberal and actually talk to each other. Um, when I do, I've done a ton of, of book talks and the people who come to those talks are liberal, usually middle-aged and older. And those are the people reading this book. I don't get any sense that um, conservative people are reading the book or have any interest in it. And I would love to see people who have read the book to reach out if they have any friends or neighbors um, who are politically conservative and, and get them um, to read this book. I just don't think there's that much interest uh, mm -hmm. from that side. I mean, maybe that's an overgeneralization, but I'm just going by the people who come to book talks. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll echo what David just said here, a book that I would recommend too, who you probably know, George Packer has become one of yeah. my favorite writers too. And um, his last book, uh, The Last Best Hope, of where he talks about the fact that we're not in conversation with each yeah. other, but he divides America not only into two Americas between conservative and liberal, but he divides it into four, that there are now four Americas. And I'm not gonna remember all four <laughs> of those off the top of my head, but I think he makes this accurate, a very accurate point that the, when you look at these, these different groups and these four Americas, that they're not in conversation with each other, that we're kind of, in our own echo chamber yeah. and we're not talking. So if there are ways that we can begin to talk, I think that that might help us to make some progress. So I want to, you know, having been trained as an academic historian and now having come over into the public arena and seeing what public historians do, I think my, my appreciation for the role of public historians has deepened and I was talking to one of my former professors at UNC Chapel Hill and was, and was telling him, you know, now that I'm in this role for the time that I'm in it, I wanna to try to find a way to get academic historians and public historians talking to each other. Academic historians generally talk to each other. They don't talk to the general public as much, but I think that it's important that we find a way to do that. So I think having these type of classes and these conversations become fundamentally important, supporting what uh, like the Department of uh, Natural and Cultural Resources is doing, supporting this this um, this history museum and what we're trying to do across the state. I will also say that I have been, in my short time in this role, have been, I think, surprised, David, to find that North Carolina, in many ways, is cutting edge in its efforts around public history. It's doing some very the state is doing some very interesting things. I have counterparts across the country. There are 50 of us who, who are kind of in this role. North Carolina's um, public history arena is much more comprehensive than most other states I've discovered. I was at a conference last year in Denver with some of my counterparts across the country, and there is absolutely no diversity there at all, none. Only North Carolina 
has had diversity at the table. Huh. So while you're hearing people talk about the need to diversify their stories, to include these kind of uh, largely underrepresented groups in conversation, they're mostly talking about it in theory mm -hmm. and not in a practical way. But because North Carolina is doing something different um, in, in this regard, I think that we have, an op we have a real opportunity here to kind of move the needle in, in ways that I think David would encourage us <laughs> to move that needle. So that's my comment. Glad to hear that. that. Okay. <laughs> Daniels was mentioned several times in your book. Very influential uh, person, white supremacist. Tell us a little bit more about his involvement in the Wilmington situation, the, uh, leading up to it and uh, perhaps following it. Well, he was one of the leaders of the whole white supremacy uh, campaign. And um, he was very interesting because uh, he claimed to be a journalist, but he wasn't. He was a politician who happened to own a newspaper, and in this case, the most powerful and influential newspaper in the state. And he used that um, as a propaganda vehicle to spread fake news and misinformation to try to goad uh, whites preying on their insecurities and on their, um, their fear. Um, making the case, much as you hear today, that our way of life is under threat. These outsiders who aren't really American are coming in and threatening your way of life. And if it takes violence, um, so be it. And, and that's what Josephus Daniels said. I mean, he worshiped the red shirts and, and in his memoirs written in the 40s, he brags about how they terrorized black men and, and, and kept them from voting. I mean, this is, you know, 50 years after the event. Um, so he was an amazing character in that he had this reputation as a, a, a reformer and as a, as a progressive when in fact he was a white supremacist. My first job out of um, journalism school was at the News and Observer and there were all these tributes to Josephus as this progressive reformer around the newsroom. Nobody had any idea of his past as, as the one or two top leaders of the white supremacy campaign um, who in his memoirs was still proud, very proud and bragged about what he had accomplished in snuffing out the black vote. Correct. Mm -hmm. Navy, yeah. And ambassador to Mexico. Mm Right. Well, Woodrow Wilson was the man who, who appointed him the session. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and you know his history, and uh, it was an ardent white supremacist, so he's not likely to bring that up. David, there, oh, yes, ma'am, go ahead. No, 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 you go ahead. Um, hi, and thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Um, I was just thinking, um, as a millennial, uh, there's so many things changing, so many information, just like many people here, uh, that... I am now learning of, um, I definitely feel that history is very important. I think that even in the medical field, one of the first things the doctor asks is your medical history <laughs> so that we don't repeat or we right. are, we actually avoid things from happening again. Now with everything that's happening now, banning of books, um, which is something that has already started in certain states. Yep. What is your stand on it? And, and what, what do you feel journalists, historians can do to really help uh, stop this? Because this is really part of erasing that history yeah. and erasing um, the lies and just perpetuate, perpetrating right. the, the lies. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Yeah, well, question. when I was uh, a, a young journalist and studying uh, at, at UNC, studying journalism, it never occurred to me that one day the President of the United States would label reporters as enemies of the people, using a direct quote uh, from Hitler and, and Goebbels, and to um, demonize the news media as liars and purveyors of fake news. I never thought I would see that happen, yet here we are. And it's now... Everybody gets their own version of history and their own versions of event. It doesn't matter if it's based on fact, if it's true or not. If you believe it, it's true. Look at January 6th. 
I have no idea how that's going to be perceived, you know, 50 years from now. Will it be this, this white nationalist, Christian white attempt to overthrow uh, a legal election and to put a demagogue in power? Or would it be patriots fighting for their country mm -hmm. and trying to restore? I don't know. But you can see these two narratives, and, and there are so many examples of this that you get to write your own history now. And there are so many avenues of communication now that there weren't back in 1898. They were just newspapers. Now we've got the internet and websites, and it's endless how these little channels uh, each have a, a sort of slightly different take on events right now. I mean, the abortion debate, you could go on and on. And it worries me that previously um, the news media was was accepted as at least trying to get at the truth and now it's completely demonized and, and they're all liars and it makes it hard hard to really report and and to, to toe the line so that's my answer yes sir oh i think our historic places give us a great opportunity to tell a lot of these stories and to introduce a lot of folks to what the history is when we have the, the uh, courage to tell the stories. Um, I'm, our organization is involved with the Bellamy Mansion in Wilmington. and uh, So we get 20,000 people go through, and we've been telling 1898 for 25 years. Uh, we talk about slavery uh, in a very, very, uh, I would say, honest way. Um, and it's, I think there, there, there are places, you know, soon, uh, Union Tavern in Milton mm -hmm. is going to be a state of sort site. What a complicated story about race mm -hmm. if we tell it. Mm -hmm. Meyer, thank you for that. It's Meyer Hyatt with, uh, Preservation North Carolina oh, okay. for years. And I mean, he's right. I think that. You know, finding a, a different way to teach history. I, one of my favorite, uh, professors at UNC Asheville colleagues there uh, was Dr. Bill Spillman, and I heard him, if you he ever hear him give a lecture, you'll just be mes mesmerized. But he talked about how, you know, he really didn't like history when he was growing up because we teach it in such a way as name, rank, serial number. And that's the way he put it. But we need to find a better way to teach it. It's, it's much more engaging than that. And I think that we need to do that. We also, you know, need to, you know, our historic places become very important because I've always felt that being able to go and actually physically touch it gives you a very different sense rather than just sitting and reading it in a book. I, I, I like both, but being able to go to historic places and, and actually visit those places and then tell a full story which North Carolina is very committed to. I mean, I'm deeply proud of the state and in, in what it does around historic preservation and then working with organizations like Preservation North Carolina, I think become very important. So supporting them, you know, that work, I think is very important for us as citizens of the state to do that. So Myra, thank you for making that point. Yes, uh, hi. Uh, so um, Kind of going off of what Dr. Waters just said a few few minutes ago, um, as a recent uh, graduate of one of the public history um, programs here in North Carolina at UNC Wellington, um, I can attest to absolutely um, North Carolina being very on the forefront of public history uh, education um, with UNC Wellington, great, great program there. NC State as well, I have coworkers there um, who are, again, kind of really working with underrepresented groups and trying to tell their stories like at UNC Wilmington, the capstone project that we did um, this past semester, um, I just recently graduated in May, um, we just did uh, working with the alumni from the Williston Ninth Grade Center in Wilmington and talking about desegregation in Wilmington um, and telling their stories there. So I can absolutely attest to um, what you mentioned and like talking about underrepresented groups like that. So that kind of leads into my question, I guess. Um, in Wilmington, there is, a, there, is a, there is a memorial to 1898 um, up there just north of downtown, kind of out of the way of the usual traffic there. Do you think that a, a memorial like that kind of tucked away in a city center is enough to for, for the city to talk about the, the events there or is, should there be something more um, to discuss actually what happened there? Yeah, I was glad to see that memorial go up and there's an interesting story behind that. But no, I don't think that's, that's enough. There needs to be a lot more and there needs to be a willingness, as we talked about before, to confront 
un unpleasant facts and unpleasant situations and and I don't know if if we've even gone gotten past that now and and that's where I think um your role and your role is mm -hmm. so important it is forcing people um to look at this yes and that's what you guys do and you do a great job and I'm really glad to hear that North Carolina is at the right. forefront I wasn't aware of that and and be you know and be I think uh willing to to show we haven't always gotten it right no. we we We've messed up in a lot of ways. If you read David Blight's book, uh, American Oracle, he talks about George Bancroft, who he says is, you know, the, the, this historian of the late 19th century historian who wrote the grand narratives of American history. And he makes the point, and, and I think Bancroft, uh, it, this, this is later picked up by writers like uh, Robert Penn Warren. And, and I would tell my classes when I was teaching, you know, David, that if you haven't read Robert Penn Warren, you're not a good Southerner if you haven't read <laughs> Robert Penn Warren. And I was surprised at how many students had not read, you know, Penn Warren's work as a Southerner who's worked through a lot of these issues himself. But um, George Bancroft, you know, he said, we like to have this triumphantless narrative of American history. That's what we want. We don't, and these stories like Wilmington, 1898, and, slavery and slavery, segregation, those things don't fit that well right. into that triumphant list narrative of American history. And we need to become more comfortable with, uh, with, with knowing that we've had, we've gone in fits and starts um, with this and we haven't always gotten it right. And I think it will make it possible for us to make that progress forward if we just be honest right. about where, what, what the history has been. Any other questions? Or okay. perhaps one more question, if there is one. If if not, that means that you all have done an excellent job. All right, all right. <laughs> but if I may, if I may, if I may, I am going to ask one more question, David, because we talked about this in the back. All right. uh, my Put me question, on the spot. Yeah, my question is, I, I want to hear this, that um, I know there were surprises for you, but I'm wondering about the impact of this project and this book on you. Well, you had asked me earlier about surprises, mm -hmm. and uh, one thing that really stunned me was the role of the Northern Press, the white Northern Press. I had assumed there would be some uh, sympathy uh, with the black population and some understanding of what they were going through, and it was completely the opposite. These reporters just swallowed the whole white supremacist, supremacist narrative of this uh, black race riot and of black men arming themselves and, and trying to destroy white culture and create uh, this black state. And that's the way, that's the story that America got. And in fact, when all these newspaper men came down to Wilmington, the white supremacists were very good at PR. They would meet them at the train station and arrange for their lodging. Uh, they would give them cigars and, and whiskey. And they would quote, a term we use today is embed. They would grab these reporters and take them out through the city and fill their head with this narrative of, of black men stockpiling arms and rising up um, to take over the white city. And that's the story America got. So that was one thing that really shocked me. The other thing that shocked me was just the level of, of open hatred by the white supremacists. Uh, first of all, they were totally open about what they were going to do, but the use of the N-word, I was shocked at just how prevalent that was in newspaper editorials, in, in campaign rallies, and in headlines. It was very disturbing, uh, and I had no idea that that was going on until I started looking at the newspaper. So those were two things that mm -hmm. jumped out at me. Well, David, thank you again, and congratulations thank on you, a Darren. wonderful book. Thank you. Thanks for coming out. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Just before we close out, I just want to say thank you, first of all, to all of you for being here tonight, um, because this is what makes the conversation possible. Your willingness to come out and be here and fellowship and, and, and communicate with us. Um, this concludes this part of the program. I want to say thank you uh, to David Zacchino and also thank you to Dr. Darren Waters, and thank you to our director, Ken Howard, for your leadership and support. Um, I heard a couple of the folks who asked questions tonight talk about being ashamed about not knowing. There is no shame. It's about learning, it's about growth, it's about conversation. Um, it's about coming together locally 
and as a state and as a nation. So, so I wanna commend you for coming out and for sharing and asking your questions. I also want to thank the staff, the folks who make it look easy and put it all together. Uh, Ms. Michelle Carr, who is our curator of special uh, public programs, thank you. Ms. Stacy Smith, Ms. Jessica Pratt, Ms. Camille Hunt, and Mr. Robert John. And I'm gonna pick on Robert for just a second. He's right over here. <laughs> because Robert talked to me about Wilmington. And he mentioned uh, what some of you mentioned. I didn't know about this. I should have known about this. Why didn't I know about this? Um, and those are the questions that, those are the great historical questions that those of us who are educators really lean on. And I'm a, I'm a veteran. I, I taught middle school, high school, and it was a high school assistant principal. So all of these things resonate with me. It's a part of my service. It's a part of my passion. And so thank you, Robert. Um, next year, <laughs> next year, I believe, is the 125th anniversary uh, of the Wilmington coup. So I'm going to put David Sacchino on, <laughs> on notice. Uh, we may ask you to come back to, to talk about that and the significance of that anniversary. So thank you. Also want to thank our tech team. Uh, Jerry Taylor and Joel Rhodes. Thank you so much for, for all of your help tonight. So be sure to look at our website uh, for upcoming events. Yes, history can be tough, but we also do some fun and cultural celebrations as well. We have our American Indian Heritage Celebration coming up, so if you want to come visit us again, come back on November 19th. We'll now move to the lobby for our book signing. Thank you so much for coming and have a safe and great night.